Joining us on the WBGO Journal is our dear friend, Steve Adubato Jr. Steve, we're joining you on a very difficult time for you after hearing about the loss of Big Steve, your dad. Has to be a very difficult time. So first, thanks for joining us. What are you thinking right now? Well, first of all, um, I want to say to you, I know you lost your dad several months ago. So my, my thoughts and prayers are with you and your family. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's interesting when you lose your dad and, and a lot of it depends upon the relationship you had with your father. And um, mine was complex to say the least and interesting. And, um, but the last 10 years uh, were very different because he's, he's been dealing with cognitive issues for many years in the last several years were a real struggle. <clears throat> but the funny thing is you lose your dad and they're private and very personal feelings uh, between a father and a son. And, and my dad and my mom have uh, been to get married for 66, 65, 66 years. And my two sisters and I, we all deal with it from a family and personal perspective. But the other part of it makes it very interesting in that he was such a public person, you know? Um, the last 10 years, not out there publicly for a variety of reasons, obviously mostly about health. But so you're getting calls from Governor Murphy and former Governor Christie and Cory Booker and this person, that person. And, <clears throat> and, and, and you feel good on one level because my dad, my dad, one of his greatest fears was not being relevant, not being recognized, not being, just being forgotten. And so on one hand, you know, it was, it was gratifying to see that, to see so many feature articles about him and so many significant publications and in the media, but then you take that away and a couple of days later, the text messages stop, the, you know, the condolences stop and you begin to realize you just lost your dad. And he wasn't just Steve Adubato Sr. You know, who did these significant things, building the Northport Center, the Robert Treat Academy, charter school, being a prominent political player, kingmaker, whatever the heck that's supposed to mean. And you just lost your dad. And so, so it's, uh, I think sometimes when you actually start talking about it, you begin to realize as you're talking about it, that uh, the grieving process is so complex, as you well know, Doug, and it hits you at different times. And it hits my mom at all different times. Um, on one hand, we wanted him to pass. I know I'm rambling right now. On one hand, we wanted him to pass because of the suffering. And then the fact that my mom's life has been consumed by dealing with my dad's illness, but then he passes and then there's some relief, but then there's all kinds of other feelings that uh, are way more complex. And so like anyone else who's listening right now to, to WBGO who's lost parent, you know that this stuff is deep, just deep. I'm sorry for rambling, Doug. No, you're not rambling at all, fact, uh, in, in fact, Steve. We appreciate you, uh, you know, talking about it. You know, you talk about memories. Share a memory, a personal memory that you and your father had that people don't know about that can give us a better sense of who he was as you say, outside of the, the big political world that everybody knew Big Steve for and all the things that he did with the children in the North Ward. How about you and him? Share a personal moment for us. So I was actually recounting this to my mom, my sisters recently, and I also told my wife, Jennifer. This always struck me. Um, my dad was very transactional, meaning, um, as you uh, know, Doug, and you talk to people who did deals with my father. He was a deal maker. And everything was about a deal. Everything was about trying to, how do you get the grant money to build the Robert Treat Academy or expand a program at the North Ward Center? And so he would use politics and political influence and power for, in large part to try to make things happen for other people, particularly in the North Ward of North. And so that was his mindset. Like, what's the deal? What's the angle? Because there's always an angle with my father when he started to realized that I was making a couple dollars in my professional life. 
he would never hesitate to ask me for increasingly large contributions, <laughs> not to politics, because as a journalist, I would never do that. But to any, any initiative they were starting, any new recreation program, any new daycare program, any new anything, I need X amount. And you had a good year last year, you know, I need more. So as he got sick, I would say about 10 years ago, I began to realize that he was suffering cognitively and he stepped back from the North Ward Center. And I kept asking myself, what can I do for him? And we had a very tough uh, relationship uh, with my growing up. Um, and he was brutally candid and just at times brutal and tough and aggressive and sometimes mean. And, uh, and I wrote a lot about that in my book, Lessons in Leadership, that I learned an awful lot about leadership, what to do and what not to do. He left a lot of roadkill along the road to success and making things happen. And so it was rough with us. So there's a point to this, trust me. So um, he kept saying in his own way of speaking at the time, I wanna swim, I wanna swim because he loves swimming. And uh, so I, I signed him up for the Montclair Y to go swimming with him. And I didn't really wanna go swimming at six o'clock in the morning, but so I signed him up for swimming and then he's swimming and he has to keep in the lane because you can't knock into other people. And he was never good at staying in his lane, even when <laughs> he was healthy. So he's knocking into people. And I'm trying to explain to the lifeguard, he's struggling a little bit. And then afterwards, he would say, you want to go to breakfast? We're going to breakfast. And I never, remember the first time I took him to a place called Plum right across the street from the Montclair Y. And we're sitting there and he just looks at me. And he, just, he started saying this a lot. He'd say, why? And I'd say, why what? And he'd say, um, why? And I'd say, what do you mean, Dad? Like, and he couldn't communicate. And he said, why helping me? And so I was like, why am I helping you? And I didn't know how to answer him. And I said, Dad, let's have breakfast. And he kept saying, but why? And he wrote down, why helping me? And I said, because, you know, I love you, my father. And he just wrote, mean to you. Mm. And I was like, well, yeah, you were. But he, the point of this, Doug, is that he didn't understand. This is so crazy. He was so powerful, so influential, so strong. He didn't understand what the deal was. Like, why would I be helping him? What do I want from him? And, and he put a dollar sign, like money. And I was like, no, I don't need your money. I, the point of this whole thing is really not about me. It's about him. He literally could never understand why someone wanted to be his friend, why someone wanted to be good to him and take care of him and try to help him, take him swimming and for breakfast. Like, what do you want from me? Mm -hmm. I can't give you anything. And so that's, that was sad to me because he didn't think at the core that he was worth helping unless he could be transactional. I know it's a long winded story, but it said a lot about him and I was sad for him. Um, but man, he was a hell of a deal maker, but there was no deal to make. He just needed help and he couldn't give anyone anything other than being with him. And that was, that was an anathema to him. He didn't get it. Sounds crazy, I know. Being such a big power broker like he was, you didn't get elected in this area unless you got the backing of your dad. Why were children so important to him? And, you and just talked about your difficult relationship with his own child. Why were kids in the North Ward important to him? He loved going to the Robert Treat Academy, to the kindergarten class, all the classes, and he would walk in, they'd yell, Big Steve, and he was physical with the kids. He would hug them and he would shake hands with them and they would, and he would do this whole thing, talk about transactional when the foundation heads and the corporate heads would come to the Robert Sheet Academy. He would train the kids to say one, two, three. He would say one, two, three and they would yell out, show me the money. It was all about getting grants. But the reality is he was never affectionate with my sisters or I. He was never particularly, um, when things went wrong for us, he was like, listen, I'm not interested in your belly aching or crying. I remember losing 
my election for student government, government president in college by five votes. And I called him from the, at the bar at school at the time, you could drink at 18 votes. And I was at Montclair State, I lost the election. And I said, dad, I lost, and I was crying. And he said, it's a stupid election in the first place. He goes, stop crying, come back here, we have work to do. He meant the work that he wanted to do. When I was elected to the state legislature in 83, when I was 25, and then lost my seat when I was literally two years later in a Tom Kane Republican landslide, I remember being very emotional on what do I do with my life? And he's like, look, cry for the next 20 minutes. But after that, cut it out. No one's <laughs> interested. What's the next thing? He goes, I have an idea. You come to work for me and use those skills to raise money. And I was like, I'm his kid. I'm struggling. I, but with the kids, he had love and affection and caring and compassion. My sisters and I would say, what about us? And he was like, look, these kids need more than you do. And they've been put behind the eight ball. He could not see us as his own kids in the same way he saw other kids. And so while it, it, would, it never made sense to me, but he really felt for those kids. And, but he had a very hard time with his own blood children showing that empathy and compassion and affection. Um, so for years we resented it and then realized that's who he was. You know, and those kids were, who are now much older, their lives are way better off because of the work he did with that Robert Reed Academy Charter School. And my sister leads it, my older sister, Therese, leads it today. And my younger sister, Michelle, leads the North Ward Center. He taught us our job was to make a difference in the lives of other people. And he was not particularly interested in our own problems or issues. He really just wasn't. What's so fascinating about your dad is the respect he got from the other side of the political aisle, too, is that Governor Christie called him a friend, knowing that uh, if you don't have the support from Big Steve or if you don't pick his brain, then you don't, got, you don't have the full picture. So he was able to cross political lines in this climate that we have right now. There, there's not much cross-pollination when it comes to political parties. What was special about him that he was able to do? Was it just his power, or was did he have a skill that was able to, to make people of both political parties see things better? You know, he, he was a Democrat, but not a Democrat from an ideological, you know, uh, perspective to the degree that, it's so hard to explain this, he liked Chris Christie personally, they were rough and tough and spoke in a gruff fashion with a lot of profanity with each other. And there was no BS between the two of them. Um, they disagreed on some things, but Chris Christie was governor. He could help the North Ward Center, the Robert Treat Academy. And frankly, he liked him more um, on a personal level than he did the Democratic candidate at the time, uh, Barbara Buono, who was running against him. He didn't connect with her. He didn't relate to her even if they may have agreed with some progressive thinking. So his view of politics was very practical. And so while it was practical, but it was also courageous because if you go all the way back to 1970 when he supported Ken Gibson for mayor, the first African American mayor on the um, Eastern seaboard, if I'm not mistaken, um, it was very dangerous. It was risky, it was courageous. We lived in a very Italian American, um, a lot of racism in our community. And my father stood up and, and did that against the incumbent mayor at the time who was a Democrat, right? Um, you had Anizio who was under, um, he was on trial, federal trial for 60 plus counts of corruption with his relationship with organized crime. And my father was like, we're not supporting him, we're supporting Ken Gibson because he believed Gibson was a better person and also would understand the work my father was doing. So my, my point is that my father would find a way whether it was in a Newark election, to do what he thought was right from an, his perspective of what was right for the city, but he was also practical and developed a relationship with Ken Gibson. And Ken Gibson was very helpful the work he did, but so was Chris Christie. And he didn't see party when it came to what he thought was most important for the people he was serving. So he wasn't the kind of Democrat that was, you know, Republicans are bad. He just wasn't. He was the ultimate practical politician 
who did what he thought was best for the people he was serving. It's, and you know, it's, and Chris Christie saw my dad at a very vulnerable point, came to our home. I remember it was Christmas a few years ago and we thought my dad was gonna pass then and, and Chris came to see him and Chris called my mom and called me right after my father passed. And beyond all the politics and the things they did together, it was personal. A lot of stuff was personal with my father too. Um, my father couldn't do anything for Chris Christie. Chris Christie couldn't do anything for him, but they liked each other and respected each other. You know, they were actually friends on some weird level. He was very successful, so he could have lived anywhere, but he chose to stay in Newark all this time. What was it about Newark that lit a fire in Big Steve? I actually don't think he could have lived anywhere. That's funny you say that, Doug, because um, he was born and raised in the old first ward of Newark by St. Lucy's Church, um, a street called Factory Street. Um, he didn't know how to live anywhere else. He was not someone who could have done well in the suburbs uh, of New Jersey or anywhere. Uh, yeah, we, we had a small home down at the Jersey Shore and he loved it down there, but he couldn't have been part of that community. He, he, he is the, was the ultimate urban slash Newark to the death guy. He loved neighborhood cafes. He loved small business people. He loved education in urban areas and trying to make it better. He, he thrived in a place like Newark and, and I don't think he could have done well in other places. Um, he was very much at home in Newark. And now my mom, who, you know, I talked to her about, you made the mistake of saying, Mom, listen, where do you think you want to be? And she said, where do I want to be? I'm going to be on Clifton Avenue where we've been in Newark forever. I said, yeah, but Ma, she said, no, I'm staying here. They're, they're just Newarkers to the core, you know? You lost your dad at 87. I lost my dad at 90. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a, a ring that I wear on my hand now that was that was his and so that's that's with me every day and the Irish Tammies and the the Notre Dame hats <laughs> what 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 memento will you keep close from your dad so I've got a picture of my dad it's so interesting I've got so many pictures in so, so many places I'm looking at my so let me, let me just say this to you. I have a favorite picture of my father and I. Um, so I have it downstairs. So my last game as a senior playing, uh, I know you're a big hockey guy, Doug. I did not play hockey. We didn't have hockey in Newark, okay? <laughs> let's get straight. We didn't, there was no skating. But I played football at Essex Catholic High School. Um, back in the day at uh, what is now known as school stadium. It was at city stadium on Bloomfield Avenue. And I remember the last game as a senior, my dad used to come to the games and uh, first he, he, he was angry that I wasn't playing more. And he would ask me what's the matter with me. You know, what, what are you doing on the bench? And then he would argue with the coach, none of which was helpful. Um, <laughs> and because he would never hold back. And, uh, the last game as a senior, I have a picture I'll show you at some point. Uh, I wore number 81. And so I had the blue number 81. He had the white number 81, the home and away jerseys. And you ran out on the field on the last day when you were a senior. And there's a picture of my dad running out. And uh, he never played high school ball. He's too small. He, he started school when he was three. He was a year and a half too young, believe it or not the grade he was in, but he always imagined himself being an athlete. And uh, running out on the field with him on uh, Father Sunday, and some of, the, some of the guys I went to school with didn't have dads, and so they're, they're with their moms. And I remember that, and the seniors ran out. And so that picture of the two of us, it's special. Special moment for you. Yeah. 
you know, you're going to have these moments. I've been talking to a lot of people, Steve. They're just going to creep up on you. And every little thing, you think you might have things under control. And uh, the first time the Fighting Irish came through the tunnel at Notre Dame <laughs> Stadium this year, I said, boy, he loved that. And you lose it because you realize nothing matters as much when they're gone. And you don't see it coming, Doug. I don't see it coming. I think I just don't see it coming. And so that's why I keep thinking about my mom. She'll, she'll sound fine. And then I'm talking to her and an hour later, she's saying, I need to be with him. And I'm like, mom, but this is what we wanted for him to pass so that you could live your life and he could stop suffering. Yeah, but now that he's gone and you go, how could she go back and forth? And you realize that I would thought I was ready to find, find to do this interview with you. And as I'm talking, things are hitting me. And I, I, I it, we're delusional when we think I got this. And we're talking to Steve Adubato Jr. here. So when you see him, he's talking about leadership. He's talking about communication. He's always in control. But you're human, Steve. You're human. And by the way, talking to my father about leadership and the introductory chapter in my book, Lessons in Leadership, um, I write a lot about him. And I will tell you, he, he, when I was, he was very aware that I was writing the book. He was just sick at the time. I remember he would write, on a piece of paper about me with a question mark. He wanted to know if I was going to write about him. And because his ego was always very strong. When you ride through Branch Brook Park, um, there's a big sign that says Steve Adubato, Stephen N. Adubato Senior Sports Complex. Even to the end, when he was able to ride through Branch Brook Park, he would want to see that sign and he would give a thumbs up and then he'd point to himself. Mm. His ego was always in check, Doug. <laughs> so, um, you know, he, he loved, he would have loved all the attention. I guess I'm not that different from my father, you know. Um, he would have loved all the attention and the praise and the accolades, um, mostly for what he's done for the people of New York. And that beautiful statue of him. I mean, how many people get a, a bronze statue? So that day, it was 2000. 13, if I'm not mistaken, I remember, you know, I, I'll be brief. I remember we were dedicating the statue to him and um, it was, it's an extraordinary statue. Um, I can't see it on the radio um, of him with these kids around him and the kids are represent the kids at the Robert Treat Academy, the kids around him, because that was his, so much of his life. And I remember the day we were dedicating it, he had kept writing on a yellow legal pad, the speech that he wanted to give, but he was really struggling with his words. And my mother called me early in the morning. You can't let your father speak in front of all these people. The media will be there. And I was like, Ma, I can't stop him. She goes, you have to stop him. It'll be embarrassing. So I remember getting there and he is in his office at the North Ward Center. He's writing and I see it. And it doesn't really make sense, the words. You know, he was struggling. And I'm holding him. I'm saying, Dad, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say what you want to say. He's like, no, I'm talking. And he was a bull. And finally, I got him to say, okay. And then we, we dedicated the statue. And I'm standing there with Chris Christie, myself, and the county executive, Joe DiVincenzo. And we're standing around him with Father Edwin Leahy, one of his closest friends from St. Benedict's Prep. We're all standing around him. And there's the microphone. And he would never back away from the microphone. And he had said he wouldn't speak. And then I saw him moving closer to the microphone. And I thought, oh, my God, is he going to? And he got to the microphone and well, you couldn't stop him because that was embarrassing. And finally, he just got to the microphone and he said, thank you very much. And I realized that he realized that he couldn't do it. Yeah, that's tough. And he just, he was so aware of his inability to communicate that he didn't want to embarrass himself. And that was so painful to see a guy that if you think I love words or the sound of my own voice, you never been in a meeting with a Doug. Nobody else mattered. He, he called his meetings. He said, this is, this is church. Mm. 
and I'm the pastor. We used to try to explain to him it wasn't church, but to him it was. <laughs> so, so as we wrap up this difficult interview for both of us. I'm sure for you, Doug. What's the one word you would describe your dad that if somebody said, I didn't get a chance to meet Steve Sr., who was he? One, two words to describe him. He was bold and he was courageous. Steve Adubato Jr., our heartfelt sympathy, deepest condolences go out to you and your family during this difficult time. The memories will never go away. Thank you, my friend, Doug. Best to you and your family. And again, sorry for, um, for, for you losing your dad. I know you understand. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, Steve.